Steve, in your various places of work, you've worked with atheists who don't share your faith. That must be really difficult. Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, I think, I was just thinking about this, I, I don't think I've worked with Christians since my undergraduate university days. Um, but the atheists I have worked with have on the whole been what I would call principled atheists as opposed to people who are atheists by accident because they can't be bothered looking. And principled atheists are quite interesting people. And I think you can have some really good discussions with someone who is an atheist because they've actually thought about it. And you can get down to what really is the fundamental difference between um, a, a, a believing person and a non-believing person. And that's, that's an interesting place to be, because I think that's where most of the discussion about um, uh, uh, Christianity in our country should be at. We have a lot of people who don't believe in God and have never been given a decent reason to. So I think there's a, it's good to work with atheists. It keeps you on your toes. It's, it's good. But surely the majority of people would say it's right to have atheists in a scientific world. You surely can't be a religious person and a scientist. Um, I would dispute that, and I think the numbers are on my side. I, I, I can't give chapter and verse on this, but I seem to recollect reading somewhere that amongst mathematicians, for example, there are a higher proportion of Christians than there are in other lines of work. Why would that be? Um, you're talking about scientists, as in you know, applied mathematics, if you like. Um, I think we make an artificial distinction. Uh, let's get down to it. Um, we, we seem to have this idea that there are religious points of view, and you hear this, you hear this reference in the press all the time. You have these kind of faith things, and that by being a faith thing, you are automatically irrational and, and um, unscientific. And then you have the scientific end, which obviously can have no truck with faith because faith is by definition irrational. I don't, I don't buy that at all. I think that is a false distinction and shouldn't be there. I think you can be quite a, a rational, principled, scientific Christian because of your life's experiences and because of the way you look at the world and the things you've discovered by looking at the world in that way. So you feel you can be unscientific and thereby accept intelligent design? Uh, I mean, I've got to unpick that sentence. There's too much in that. Um, I, don't even, I don't even think intelligent design is, is the issue. I think what we have to get back to is this, this fantastically named principle, which is applied in kind of modern science, called the principle of mediocrity. And the principle of mediocrity basically states don't presume that there's anything special about you. Don't presume there's anything special about humans. Don't presume there's anything special about Earth, the solar system, our universe. Make a presumption that unless there's evidence to the contrary, everything you see around you is normal. Now, if you take that in conjunction with, with really the founding rule of science, which is from William of Ockham, Ockham's razor, which basically states the most simple explanation is most likely to be the correct one. That's a, that's a paraphrase. I cannot remember. He puts it much more elegantly. But that's, that's the gist of it. The simplest explanation is most likely to be correct. Science takes those two things on board. Principle of mediocrity. Don't assume there's anything special about you or what you're looking at. So if I pick up a ball and drop it and it falls, I will presume that if I go to North America, it will do exactly the same thing. Don't presume there's anything special about where you are. And rule number two, uh, Occam's razor, the idea of the simplest explanation is most likely to be correct. And a good example of that would be if I'm standing at the top of the staircase here and I roll, I roll a ball and I turn around and don't look and turn around 10 seconds later, the ball's at the bottom of the stairs, how did it get there? You could say, Space aliens arrived in a spacecraft, came in through the window, picked up the ball, went downstairs and dropped it. You could say that, but Occam's razor, the simplest explanation that was likely to be true, states that basically gravity acted on the ball and took it down the stairs. And unless you've got really good reason to say otherwise, you dismiss the space aliens arrived in their spacecraft and rolled the ball down the stairs. And you go with the simple explanation, which is most likely to be true. Now, science is based on those two things. Don't look for a supernatural input. Assume there isn't one. And I think that's a good rule. I think as a Christian, 
who works in science, admittedly not in the, you know, the creation area at all. I, I'm not an expert in that at all. I think that's a decent rule, and that is a rule that we apply to the rest of our lives. We, we buy insurance because we look at the facts. We, uh, we buy a piece of electronic equipment by looking at the facts and what the thing can do. We don't appeal to you know, go to sacrifice a goat to tell me what television to buy. We don't do that kind of thing. We apply rationality all through our lives, but somehow or other we've got this notion that as soon as I walk through the church door, I have to chuck rationality out the window. I don't, I don't buy that at all. I think that's wrong. I think it's, you, you can and I would float the notion of should apply scientific methodology to your religion. Have you, have you done that? Have you been um, tempted to try, as a scientist, to adopt a scientific model to your faith? Is that possible? I, 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 yes, and I, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, I mean, the reason... I, things get complicated and a bit blurred here. But, you know, I'm, I'm a third-generation Adventist. Um, I was the first person in my family to go to university and, and, and you know, do a science degree. Um, what, I, what I did with that way of, you know, you're trained to think in a certain way. I got into all kinds of bother when in my 20s trying to apply that way of thinking to my faith. But um, I, I don't know, we've got time to go into it now, but uh, basically I became a Christian in my early 20s because of what I saw as an intervention by God in my life when I asked him to do it. I got myself in such a pickle. Things weren't going well at all. And uh, I, I said to God, all right, let's do it. Let's do the acid test. If you're there, sort this. If you're not, okay. I'll, I'll move on and do something else. And something was there and sorted it. But science depends on um, observation, um, analysis, uh, and the, the bringing forward of, of theories. Um, does faith um, uh, subject itself to scrutiny, do you think, scientific scrutiny? Um, I think we tend to run away from that. I'm not sure why it shouldn't. I think things are more complicated. Um, uh, that, that's, a, um, that's a, a question which I think people have to answer for themselves. For me... Isn't that a cop out? Are, are, uh, are you saying yeah. to me that therefore <laughs> faith cannot be open to scrutiny? Scientific scrutiny? No, uh, no. All right, I'm, I, I am going to talk purely for me. I'm not trying to say that this is an official position of any church or anything. This, my, my position, my understanding of my life and what's happened to me and the things I've seen. I've seen enough evidence in my life to allow for the notion of an interventionist God. Right, now that... Um, I have to sort of backtrack a bit here. I, I, at one point in my life, I asked the God thing, whatever it was, for some assistance, and some assistance came through. Now, what I then have to do is figure out what that meant. Now, I'm a third-generation Adventist. Does that mean that the God thing that helped me was my traditional Adventist God? I don't know. Like, let's take another example. You're in a room, you put a ball on the table, you turn round, you turn back, the ball's not on the table, it's up on top of a bookshelf or something, and you don't know how it got there. If you know that there's another person in the room, then the answer would be that the other person picked the ball up and put it up there, because there's no mechanism. Gravity won't take the ball from the table to the top of the bookshelf. The wind didn't blow. Back to this idea of the least complicated solution is most likely to be correct, I reckon my mate Fred, whoever it was that was in the room with me, shifted the ball. That is a reasonable thing. Now, if you, and, and this is where I think the whole creationist, evolutionist debate actually hinges, and it's not about creation and evolution. It's about allowing for um, a, um, a, a God thing. I'm, I'm really trying to think of the right words and failing, because when you say God, people bring a whole lot of baggage with it. Allowing for some kind of non-human more intelligent influence in the system. Do you, do you accept that that is possible or do you not? If you don't, 
then you end up going down an evolutionary path. If you do think that, okay, possibly there might be a thing which we might choose to call God, which acts on this universe and this world that we see ourselves in, um, then you might go down a different route. But I think, I think all arguments about whether the Earth is uh, 6,000 years old and Bishop Usher's calendar and all the rest of it, all those follow from, can I accept the notion of an intelligent universal designer or something, God thing, or can I not? What you're saying to me is, the truth is not there. The truth to support the creative theory just isn't there. Right. Popular misconception of science is that science says that things are or things aren't. No scientist worth their salt will ever say that. And the guys at CERN, the, you know, the, the huge pile of money that's buried in the ground outside Switzerland, um, they got themselves in the spot of bother a while back because someone within CERN was asked the question, I've heard it said that, it, when you turn this machine on, there'll be an enormous black hole and we'll all disappear. And the man from CERN, being a proper scientist, said, well, you know, there is a possibility, but blah, blah, blah. And the fact he said there is a possibility was then interpreted by the press as meaning, oh, no, when we turn the machine on, there's going to be a black hole and we're all going to disappear. What the scientist said was that there is a possibility, because there's always a possibility. The possibility might be infinitesimally small, but my understanding, which is limited, and I'm not an expert, of, of quantum theory states that there is a finite chance that were I to drop a pain on my leg, it would go straight through my leg. There is a possibility that that will happen. It is minute. And to all practical intents and purposes, it isn't going to happen. So I, I think there's a popular misconception that scientists always deal in yes or no answers. Scientists never deal in yes or no answers. They always deal in probabilities. So I look at my life, I look at my experiences, I look at what I've seen, because that's all you've got. And I say, the balance of probability in my experience, and I can't rely on anyone else for this, the balance of probability in my experience is, I I'm going to go with this God thing, and I'm going to try and work out what that's about. I am I right? Capital R-I-G-H-T. I don't know. Am I wrong? I don't know. And I don't think any scientist worth their salt would use those words. So, actually, some of them do, but <laughs> I think you do it for political effect, but anyway. Early on, you dismiss the, the atheists, and I, I believe you, you feel you can get into their mind and you know what motivates them. I think the atheist route, the principled atheist route, is a very hard place to live. And I think of one of the people I, I used to work with who was a very principled atheist. He put me onto the works of Richard Dawkins, and because of him, I, I read all Dawkins' books. Um, he was very firm atheist. A friend of his, he lived in Brighton, a friend of his got quite badly mugged one night and this chap was quite upset about this. And it was kind of at that point that I, I recognised that this guy's hard rationalism, very hard rationalism, he was quite difficult to work with because he had no truck with anything. But his friend got beaten up and that hurt in a way that he struggled with, with his hard rationalist view to things. And I think if, if you believe there, there is no point and no purpose and no morality, we haven't touched on the morality issue, but there's no, there's no notion of, of absolute morality in our universe, that's a hard, hard place to live. Um, I would rather live in the other camp, which says that there is a point um, and that there is a, a, a morality and that there is a purpose to where we are and what we're doing and, and where we're headed. Now, you might think that that's just wishful thinking. I hope there's a point. But I, I go back to the, to the science of, uh, sorry, the, the observational part of science. I looked at what happened in my life and I saw, a po I saw an intervention from a, 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 a force outside myself when I asked for it. And I, I have to deal with the consequences of that. I think I've established for myself that there is a purpose, and that purpose does care about me. I then have to figure out what all that means. That's a whole, that's a lifelong thing. But I have to make that split. I have to fall in, is there a point camp? Is there not a point camp? I have to make that split, which I think I got out of the way quite early on, so that I was quite happy about that. I see in you observation, inquiry, 
um, question, questioning, um, which you would expect from a scientist, somebody of your training and your, your background. Do you secretly pray that sometime within your lifetime here on Earth, or perhaps somewhere else in another place, the final truth is discovered and we do find out? Is that your real wish? I think that might be a fool's errand. I, um, I think that the quest, the, the pursuit of that is important. I think the ultimate realization of it is beyond our ken. Um, as someone, some famous scientist once said, the world is not only stranger than you, can Im uh, than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. I think we're a lot, you know, every dig away the guys at CERN again, every dig away at what's going on at this fundamental level of, of nature reveals another huge chunk of stuff. I mean, who would have thought quantum mechanics back in, in the 1920s, 1930s? A completely topsy-turvy way of looking at the world. Go back a few years from that, back to Einstein, who turned Newton's world upside down. It seems that every 50 years or so, something else comes along which fundamentally alters the way we look at things. I would be surprised if that stopped. I, I, there's no chance of that stopping in my lifetime. We're just going to hurtle on discovering more and more weird things and have to try and figure out some kind of framework in which all this weirdness makes some kind of sense. And I like that. I think that's fun. That's why I'm a scientist, because I like that kind of thing. But if you ever are fortunate enough to enter the kingdom of heaven, do you think you're going to continue to be a troubled soul then? Oh, no, look, I've, got to, I've got to correct you here. I am not a troubled soul. I mean, this, this quest is not in the remotest bit troubling. I think it's life-affirming, it's fun. I, there's nothing I like more than sitting down and watching some obtuse BBC4 documentary about space-time continuum or something. It's marvellous. I love it. I'm a Star Trek fan. It's terrific. Um, it's not troubling in the slightest. And I would be very disappointed if there's a simple answer to all this. <laughs> I'd be quite happy to, uh, to plug away, uh, you know, with the master scientist himself and, you know, how does that work? OK, all right, all right. It'll take me 50 years to get my head around that one. Let's move on to something else. Uh, it's not troubling in the slightest, it's very appealing.